uh, how about a warm welcome for Scott? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us here tonight. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, we're very happy always to come out and talk about the book um, and about these events. And we usually like to start with a really short reading from the book. This is from the beginning of part two. Um, and it's a little uh, description here of the memorial that came to be in Copley Square after the bombing, which some of you may have visited um, in the days or in the weeks after the bombing. And this chapter is called A City Reborn. It began with a handful of small American flags tucked into the barriers that blocked off Boylston Street. Almost by the hour, in those first uncertain days after the bombing, the makeshift memorial grew, becoming strangely powerful and enduring, a place of pilgrimage and reflection for the thousands of people who flocked to Copley Square. It was as if by getting close, by breathing the air, they might understand what had happened there. Many felt compelled to leave a token, some symbol of their grief or solidarity. And so the bouquet of flags became, too, a rising pile of race medals, candles, and rosary beads. It swelled with running shoes and baseball caps and arrangements of fresh spring flowers, purple irises and yellow daffodils and white lilies. It became, as the days went by, a free-form shrine, adorned with hockey pucks, a bag of Boston baked beans candy, and clamshells bearing messages like, Boston will run again. Everything had its place, the stuffed Wisconsin badger, the quartet of elf figurines with bees on their pointy hats, and the quilt of handwritten note cards left by visitors from around the world. Houston loves Boston, Greece loves Boston, Tibet stands with Boston, Colombia is with Boston, we will not submit. May the light outshine the darkness. So I'm going to start and just explain a little bit about where this book came from and how it fits into other projects uh, that we have done at the Globe. So just in case anyone's not clear, Jenna and I are both reporters at the Globe. We've both been there for a long time. In fact, we started on the same day, we think, right? Yes, Many we did. years ago. And sat next to each other. And sat next to each other. Um, and so this is very much a Globe project. Jenna and I wrote this book. but. It was on the foundation built by our colleagues, who, of course, spent a tremendous amount of time and energy those first few days, weeks after the bombing, chronicling everything that was happening, so far as we understood it. Um, Jenna was among that group at the time. She did a lot of the early work um, on, the, on the bombings. I write for the magazine, so I'm not, I wasn't sort of directly involved, or I wasn't much involved that first uh, week. But, over the last few years, The Globe has done a series of uh, books that we felt kind of took what the paper did and, and kind of extended it beyond just the, the pages uh, that we, you know, the newsprint pages that we get every day. Things that merited further attention, things that were stories or people of national or international significance. And so uh, a few years ago, as Josh mentioned, Jenna worked on a biography of Ted Kennedy called Last Lion. The thinking there was that this was somebody who had had this towering influence over American life and politics for so many years, and nobody knew him better than the Globe. We had covered him for decades, and our reporters knew him. We had the institutional memory, the archives, and so we did a big independent biography that Jenna uh, was a big part of. Um, a few years later, we applied the same logic to Mitt Romney when I co-authored a biography of him. Again, it was a Globe project. And the thinking was, well, here is somebody who could be president, and people don't really know that much about him. And yet we know a lot about him. We've known uh, about him and written about him since he was here as a Bain, uh, Bain Consulting, Bain, cons Bain Capital executive in the, in, you know, in the 80s. And who better to tell that story you know, than us? And so we set out to write a big independent biography of him. And sort of like the Kennedy book, the Romney book kind of became the Bible about his life. Uh, for anyone wanting to know about this man who was, you know, was very close to being president. Um, colleagues of ours, Shelley Murphy and, and uh, Kevin Cullen, did a big book on Whitey Bulger a couple years ago. 
uh, when he was apprehended and, and going to trial. So you can see how this story very much fits into that. I mean, this was a story clearly, I think it was evident from the hours afterward that resonated well beyond Boston. The marathon is very much a Boston event, but it's also an international event. People fly in from all over. Many people have run it. They have a special connection to it. And of course, that week, that, that day, and then that, that week of the bombings, people everywhere were following it very closely. And so when we started to talk about what kind of book we wanted to do, there were lots of options, lots of different directions we could go in. Um, but I think Jen and I both realized that we wanted this book at heart to be about people and about uh, the kind of human narrative and to see and to feel the story of everything that happened through the eyes of specific people. Um, we didn't want to just have it be kind of a retelling of those frantic first few days. We wanted to talk about the people whose lives were affected by this, the people who helped, the people who you know, were injured, the people who lost somebody. And we thought if we had enough of them and we had the right group of characters, we could really help people understand what it was like to live this story and in, in, in so doing kind of tell the larger uh, narrative of, of you know, this tragedy that had um, befallen the city. So we ended up settling on a core group of people to follow in the book, and that's really what the book is about. Not just that week, but in the months after uh, the bombing, when a lot of the lights were turned off, the cameras went away, the kind of, you know, that, that adrenaline was gone, and then the, I guess the fear maybe had ebbed a little bit. Um, of course, these people's lives are gonna be affected well beyond that, and we wanted to stick with them and see what that was like and what they were going through. And I'll let Jenna talk a little bit about and introduce our five people, and I'll show you some photos of them if she does that. So we, um, you know, we started work on the book probably in late May or early June of 2013, so it was really very soon after the bombing. And we, um, you know, did what we always do as journalists, which is begin reaching out to people, trying to explain what we're trying to do and why we want to do it and um, hoping that we will find people who in some way feel the importance of telling their own story and are ready in some way to work with us. And as you can imagine in this situation, there were many people who were not ready and not yet willing if they would ever be. Um, we wrote a lot of letters. We tried very hard to express um, our approach, uh, our goal to be sensitive and honest and fair and complete in telling the story. And ultimately, I felt, I feel like we were incredibly lucky in the people that we did connect with and ultimately um, who worked with us. Uh, they were tremendously brave, generous people with a true gift for telling their own stories. So one of those people um, was Heather Abbott, who is a young woman in her 30s from Newport, Rhode Island, who would go every year with her friends to the Red Sox game on Patriots Day and then they would leave the game, uh, walk over to the finish line on Boylston Street and watch the runners coming in. So she was standing right outside the door of Forum, a bar and restaurant on Boylston, when she heard the first explosion and turned to look. And then just seconds later, of course, uh, the second bomb exploded uh, just a few feet away. She was thrown through the door into the restaurant in the midst of all of that chaos. Um, Heather is a remarkable person. Um, she, um, she, she, her story turned out to be a little bit unusual, uh, more so even than we realized when we first approached her in that when she got to the hospital that night, um, the doctors there were actually able to save her badly damaged left foot and leg. And, um, the prognosis looked good and she was filled with hope, um, but during the course of the week that followed, her condition deteriorated and ultimately Heather faced an incredibly difficult decision about whether she would keep her damaged foot and leg um, and live a life that would be very much compromised by that or whether she would actually choose herself to amputate the leg. Um, it was her choice to make. She, as you can imagine, struggled with it greatly she finally decided that she would choose the amputation and forge um, a very different life, but with a great determination to reclaim the life that she'd had before. So Heather's story is at the very heart of our book, um, and we're very privileged to be able to tell it. 
This is Dr. David King. Um, he's a trauma surgeon at Mass General Hospital, also an army surgeon who had served in both Iraq and Afghanistan at the time of the bombing. He ran the marathon that day. He had just arrived home in Cambridge with his wife and his two young children when he began to get text messages telling him what had happened. He ran inside, he grabbed a banana and a pair of scrubs and went straight to the operating room at Mass General where he um, operated on some of the most severely injured um, people from that day. And it, it, we were very excited to have David as part of the book because what he did for us was allow us to really open up a window on the medical response that day, which was so incredible um, and so incredibly important in saving as many lives as were saved. Many people have said, as you know, that the death toll could have been far, far greater had, had this not happened in a place where we had access to such amazing institutions and, and physicians. Um, this is a picture of Crystal Campbell here in the front row in the flowered dress. I'm sure you're all familiar with her face and her beautiful smile. Um, it was really important to us to try, if we could, um, to tell a story of one of the three people who were killed that day on Boylston Street. And uh, we didn't know if that was something that we'd be able to achieve. Um, we we're very lucky to be able to work a little bit with Crystal's family and also with many of her friends and coworkers who helped us to capture, I hope, uh, some of her just um, tremendous charisma, her um, spirit, her generosity. Um, and um, we worked very hard to try and um, do justice to the person that she was and the mark that she left in the short time that she had. Um, Dave McGillivray is the director of the Boston Marathon on the right and um, just a delightful character in his own right, um, a very gifted storyteller with a long history uh, of orchestrating every detail of this storied race. Uh, we felt strongly that the marathon itself is like a main character in this story that we were telling and what Dave did again was give us a way to get very close to those very complex um, events and uh, show you know what a great uh, tremendous undertaking the race is and also the many ways in which it was affected by the bombing in 2013. Shana Catone on the left is a young Boston police officer just in her 20s um, Shana was, uh, grew up in New York City. She was a teenager when 9-11 happened. She was very deeply affected by those events. And she told us uh, that one of the reasons that she fell in love with the city of Boston when she came here to go to college at Northeastern was because um, of how safe she felt in Boston compared to how she had felt in New York after 9-11. And so Shana was working in detail that day at the finish line. She was uh, stationed in between the two bombs when they went off. And uh, Shana sprang into action. She was instrumental in saving some lives that day. She uh, connected with Shana for the first time just a few days after the bombing. Um, spoke with her on the phone while she was driving in her car down to New York to see her dad uh, and take some time to kind of recuperate herself. And I was just immediately struck by what a, just a, an incredibly honest and forthcoming and, and, and really um, open person she was. She wasn't afraid to tell me, you know, that she had been scared. She wasn't afraid to tell me that she was deeply, deeply affected by what had happened. Um, her honesty was, was so striking that when we decided to do the book, I immediately thought of her and wanted to go back to her and go deeper into her story. And she was not sure if that was something that she was going to be able to do. So I spent a lot of time with her, um, kind of making the case for this book. And in the end, um, very fortunately, Shana uh, decided to work with us. And we were very happy about that. We, we were torn in making some of these decisions about which way to go in the book between different kinds of characters. At one point, we talked a lot about trying to focus on um, someone very high up in law enforcement who was involved with actually directing the investigation that week. Uh, but we came to feel really strongly that, that telling the story of just, you know, a cop on the street that day 
particularly one as young as Shana, um, and a woman, obviously a, a minority in the police force, uh, just would have a kind of um, resonance that, that could work really well. And I think that we're both glad that, that we made that choice. And these, of course, are the Sarnayev brothers, Tamerlan and Jahar. Um, you all have heard a lot about them recently. Um, we, in doing these talks about the book, you know, upon occasion people have asked us, why did you decide to, to make their story part of the book? Um, why did you decide to devote a whole chapter to going deep into their lives and their backstory? And I guess for myself, I, I'm always a little taken aback by that question. Um, not that it's not a fair question, but for me, as a journalist, um, you know, the hardest questions are often the ones that, that we need to ask the most and the, need, the ones that we need to dig deepest to try and answer. Uh, we had support from some incredible colleagues in telling this part of the story. Uh, our former Moscow bureau chief, David Filipov, traveled twice to Dagestan in the summer of 2013 to try and understand uh, where the family had come from, how they had ended up in America. Um, we, we spoke to dozens of people uh, to try and understand what their immigrant experience was like and what happened to their family once they got here to Boston and to Cambridge. And, um, you know, I think as the trial has progressed, I certainly have felt, really ever since the bombing happened, the intense need that people have to try and make sense of these events. I think we all understand on one level that we're never going to grasp why, why anyone would do something like this, but at the same time, we um, felt that it was vitally important that we go as far as we could to try and examine this um, and step back and look at it clearly. So that's part of that's part of the story that we tell in the book. Um, the city of Boston is, of course, one of the most important characters, if you will, in this story. And in um, putting the book together, we happened upon and discovered so many small stories of individuals, people whose names you don't know, who were in one way or another swept up into these unprecedented events and in small ways whose lives were changed by them. And we try throughout the book to focus on some of those stories. Um, and Scott's going to read a little bit uh, from one of them that you probably will recognize. So you may remember, <clears throat> now this guy is more, a little bit more known because of the trial he testified, but do you remember that week one of the most dramatic stories was of the, the guy who was carjacked by Tamerlan and he was taken for this 90 minute I wouldn't call it a joyride exactly, but he was basically kidnapped for 90 minutes and driven around, and he thought at any moment that he was going to die, that, that you know, they had a gun and he known what they had done at the marathon. And so anyway, I, I want to read a little passage um, from our chapter on Danny, uh, which is called Death, Death is So Close to Me, and that's one of the things that he felt. And Danny... One of my favorite things about the story is that he was actually, it's like a classic case if you do the right thing and get punished for it, because he was driving home from work, it was 10 o'clock, and he remembered that he had forgotten to send a text message back to his friend, and so instead of texting while driving, right, which is what a lot of people would do, he very responsibly pulls to the side of the road so he can send his text message back safely, uh, and that's when he gets the rap on the window. So I'm going to read a little bit from... Uh, the chapter about, about their car ride. It's not so easy, Danny replied when Tamerlan first told him to start driving. He was nervous, his hand shaking. He could barely control the wheel, the car veering out of the lane. Tamerlan, not wanting to draw attention, told him to relax. Drive like nothing happened, he told him in a calming voice. Play it cool. Danny's heart was pounding. Just don't kill me, he thought. Don't hurt me. They continued west. Tamerlan asked Danny where he was from. I'm Chinese, he said, thinking it might help to emphasize that he was not American. Okay, you're Chinese, Tamerlan said. I'm a Muslim American. Chinese are very friendly to Muslims, Danny assured him. We are so friendly to Muslims. As they talked, Danny cast himself as a recent immigrant with no friends and limited command of English. He apologized for his halting speech. In truth, he was hiding behind that self-portrait, trying to buy time to strategize. Trained as an engineer, he made scrupulous mental notes of street signs 
and passing details, even as he abided Tamerlan's command not to study his face. Don't look at me, Tamerlan shouted at one point. Do you remember my face? No, 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 I don't remember anything, he said. Tamerlan laughed. It's like white guys. They look at black guys and think all black guys look the same, he said. Maybe you think all white guys look the same. Exactly, Danny said, though he thought, he thought nothing of the sort. It was one of the many moments in their strange conversational chess match. Danny playing up his outsider status, playing down his wealth. He claimed the car was older than it was, and he understated his lease payments. And Tamerlan trying to make Danny feel sufficiently at ease so he wouldn't do anything to draw attention to the car. When Tamerlan asked him what he was doing in the US, Danny didn't tell him he had a job, in part because he didn't want Tamerlan to think he had any close relationships with people, people who might grow worried about Danny's whereabouts, call the police, which he feared might drive Tamerlan to do something rash. Better to figure his own way out of this, Danny thought. So he told Tamerlan he had just finished a graduate degree at Northeastern and had been in the US only 18 months. Oh, Tamerlan said, that's why your English is not very good. It seemed to help that Tamerlan even had trouble with Danny's pronunciation of the word China. In truth, Danny had come to the US in 2009 for a master's degree, graduating in 2012, and returned to China to await a work visa. He came back in early 2013, leased the Mercedes, moved into a high rise with two Chinese friends, and dived into his work in a startup. Eventually, Tamerlan put the gun on the armrest, satisfied that Danny was behaving as directed. He asked him for the pin for Danny's ATM card. Danny contemplated giving him a fake one, but he thought better of it. When he told Tamerlan his pin, Tamerlan asked him if the number was his birthday. It was really the birthday of Danny's close friend, but Danny didn't want him to think he had any friends, lest Tamerlan think someone was waiting for him. So he told Tamerlan it was his girlfriend's birthday, and then his girlfriend lived in China. Does anyone care about you? Tamerlan asked him. There's no one who cares about me, Danny replied. So Danny's story illustrates what Jenna said, in that there are many quiet stories in this book, along with the five main characters um, that we tell about. And you know, this city really was a character in, in this um, awful tale, and we really wanted to try to bring that to light, um, both in the story and then some of the pictures that we included in the book. So I'm just going to run through a, a cycle of pictures Quickly, a lot of these are going to be familiar to you, probably, but um, they still have a lot of power, I think, even, even two years later. Um, so this is the iconic photo shot by John Tomaki of the Globe. This kind of became the image that defined the marathon bombing of this old runner on the ground, um, and these three cops looking around, shell-shocked, wondering what just happened. This, of course, is Carlos Arredondo in the cowboy hat rescuing um, Jeff Bauman. Jeff was one of the double amputees um, at the bombing, and Carlos uh, was his rescuer in many ways and helped race him to an ambulance and helped save his life. This is the scene on Boylston Street shortly after the bombing when everyone was racing to save lives. This is a, not, doesn't maybe on its face look like a dramatic photo, but, but it really is. I mean, the Boston Marathon had been running for 116, 17 years. It had never stopped before. They had never stopped the race for anything. This was the first time. And this was the scene when they put up a barricade uh, for runners uh, near the Mass Ave Bridge. So, I mean, think about it as a runner, right? You've run 25 miles at this point. You've been training for months, maybe even years to run this race and you're told that you can't go on. And of course, in time, people would understand why that happened, but in that moment, people tell of, you know, just fury at being told that they couldn't continue because you've come this far. The finish line is really just a little ways away, and yet you can't get there. Of course, as the runners get the news, the, um, you know, the reactions become very emotional. People are distraught worried about loved ones at the finish line and so forth. This is just a scene outside Boston Medical Center. Um, Jenna mentioned it earlier, talking about David King, but it really is remarkable that only three people lost their lives actually that day uh, on Boylston Street. If this had happened anywhere else, it really almost anywhere else in America, even somewhere else in Boston, that probably wouldn't have been the case. But the fact that nobody who was brought to a hospital died is an amazing feat, and, and it speaks to one of the things that Boston is known for, which of course is having world-class um, medical professionals. This, of course, the picture you've all seen of Martin Richard, 
that went around the world. And this is Lingzi Liu, the BU graduate student. And then this is a picture of Crystal Campbell's mother, uh, Patty, and, and uh, her brother, Billy. I love this photograph. This was taken at a vigil in, um, at a Dorchester Park uh, one or two days after the bombings, I believe. And then, of course, the memorial, the makeshift memorial that started to grow in Copley Square. With these messages that people would live from all over the, leave from all over the world. I don't know, some of you, or maybe all of you, probably went down there and saw it. It was a really moving thing to see. And I thought the messages, and the, there were various places where people were leaving notes, and I thought those were particularly powerful because you just had these, people really identify with, you know, even people who weren't from here really identify with the marathon, especially if they're in town for it. Uh, and this was such an unimaginable act, and, and you saw that, people sort of wrestling with that in the messages. Of course, that Thursday was a, was, it was a crazy day. It started with president, the president coming in town for the interfaith service, Right, but then later that day is when the FBI first put out the surveillance photos of the brothers walking on Boylston Street. And then, of course, after the, shortly after that, they kill MIT police officer Sean Collier. Um, that night in, in uh, Watertown was the firefight, right, where they finally catch up with them. I, I know you know, many of you know this story. Um, Richard Donahue was an MBTA police officer who responded. He was shot in the leg, probably by friendly, friendly fire, but nobody has confirmed that officially yet, I believe, right? That has not been officially confirmed, but by all accounts, that's more, more, more than likely what happened. Um, and came very close to dying on a Watertown street, but was rescued by um, uh, some, fire, uh, some paramedics from, from Watertown. And I don't know if you, you I don't know if, how much you felt it down here, but it, this was, Friday was one of the most surreal days uh, that I've ever experienced because the city was shut down. If you lived anywhere near Watertown, there was nobody on the streets. The, the stores were closed. The tea was shut down. You couldn't go outside. You weren't supposed to go outside at all. You were supposed to stand and lock the doors, right? And yet it was school vacation week. It was a nice day. People wanted to be outside. Um, and then you had scenes like this of, you know, stormtroopers walking through Watertown looking for this, we thought one suspect, but we didn't really know, or there more. I mean, at this point, we didn't know the extent of the plot. Um, and this photo, I think, captures it as well as anything. This, this lovely, this sort of wonderful portrait here of the tension between being really scared and wanting to stay inside and close the windows and turn out the lights, but also being intensely curious at what is going on outside, right? I mean, this, this kind of thing never happened in really anywhere, but I mean, certainly not in Watertown. And so you had this kind of push-pull between wanting to kind of stay away and hunker down, but also kind of, you know, you'd see things race past, you'd see people on the street, and you'd be wondering what's going on. Is that where he is? Um, uh, and then, of course, we find out that he is hiding in a dry-docked boat in the backyard of David Henneberry uh, in Watertown. Um, where he is pulled off from the boat and then put in an ambulance and taken to the hospital. And then there was that immense uh, feeling of, that, that feeling of immense elation once word got out. I think it was, what, quarter to nine, right? 8.45 or something that night, more or less, that we learned that he was in custody. And just that kind of exhale, I mean, it was palpable, I think, all across the region, all across Boston, but particularly for people in Watertown who were very scared. Um, And this is a picture of uh, this is a picture of Heather Abbott um, after the amputation. Of course, this was in late May, I think, right, where she was had the opportunity to throw out the first pitch at a Red Sox game. And Jenna has a lovely passage in the book about her being really nervous about this and kind of taking on um, kind of the expectations and uh, of everybody in the city, not just the sort of survivor community, but of kind of everybody that that. She needed to kind of get up there and perform and show that not long after amputation, she would be okay and she could throw this ball and she would throw a strike. And she was very nervous about it and she talked about doing it in a wheelchair, right, at one point. And her therapist, her physical therapist, were like, absolutely not. You got to hop out there. You got to do it. And, and she did it, right? And she got out there without thinking. She didn't have time. She didn't want to think about it. So she just got out there, I think, in kind of one motion, got there and just threw the ball. But it was a, it was, I, don't, I don't know if it was a strike, but right? Was it a strike? It was a good pitch. 
it did get to the mitt of Jared Saltalamacchio, the catcher. Uh, and then, of course, there were a number of tribute events and, and, and running events in the, in the days afterward um, that were very emotional in their, in their own right. Um, this is Carlos Arredondo and Jeff Bauman, again, being honored at Fenway Park. Um, and this was, um, this is Crystal, Karen, Crystal Campbell's parents, Billy and Patty, who came to the memorial in Copley Square only on the last morning it was there. The city at some point announced in, I think it was in June that they, right, in June, yeah. that they were going to take it down and they were going to try to preserve some of the stuff in city archives, some of the, you know, crosses and figurines and shoes and all that stuff. And so they kind of announced it publicly that this is going to be the last chance to come. And I think this was, Billy and Patty could not bring themselves to come until this last morning. And I think you can see from their faces that um, even then it was, a, of course, a very difficult experience for them. This is a photo of Jane Richard, uh, who you're all familiar with, um, singing the uh, national anthem before, I think, one of the playoff games in 2013. And then, of course, you have the um, great scene at the, at the duck boat parade when the Red Sox won, where uh, I think that's Johnny Gomes who's putting the Red Sox trophy with the Boston Strong shirt on the, the finish line. Um, it does seem amazing that they actually won that, that they won that World Series. It sort of seemed like just what the city needed. Um, so maybe it was dialed in in, in some fashion. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about afterward and then we can talk about the trial? Well, the afterward? Just, no, I mean just about like Heather. And oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Sure. So um, as Scott mentioned early on, we, uh, uh, it was important to us to tell the story beyond that week. That Certainly the events of that week in and of themselves, completely unbelievable, um, and a book in themselves. But as he said, the story, still goes on. It's a story that will never be completely finished. So we were lucky. Um, although we had very ambitious deadlines for the book, we did work hard to, to push against them, to try and capture as much um, forward progress in real time as we could. Fortunately for us, Heather turned out to be um, one, of the, one of the survivors who was kind of the quickest to make progress. Um, she was one of the first to leave the hospital and go home, one of the first to um, go back to work. She was one of the first to uh, actually start running again on a special prosthetic uh, design for that purpose. And so we were able to be with her uh, for a lot of that and to document it and to make it part of the story. And people have told us in reading the book, um, and this is always very gratifying to hear that Although it's a hard story, uh, and for some people, it is a story that they have no desire to revisit, which is perfectly understandable. But for those who do dive in and read the book, um, they will often tell us that they're surprised by how much there is there that is hopeful, um, that is affirming, um, and that is even inspiring that comes from these events. And that's nothing to do with us, it's just, um, you know, the story of a city and a group of people who in many cases reached down deep and found a strength that I do think has been inspiring for many of us. So, um, so, uh, where, uh, Well, I was just going to add on that note, can I tell yes, the Alison yeah. Alice Kern story? Oh, yes, you that should, this yes. This. So yes. one story that we have in the book that I really love, again, this is sort of fits into the category of kind of a minor character, if you will. Um, but still has a wonderful anecdote. There's a woman named Allison Byrne who lives in Boston. She is, uh, a lot of marathoners will tell you that they love it, right, and they crave it, and they love guy friends like this, you probably do too, who go from event to event and they can't get enough. She was not that person, she hated it, but she felt like she wanted to do this one marathon, and she was almost there, and she was coming down the left side of Boylston Street when the first bomb went off. She wasn't sure what it was, but, you know, it didn't look good to her, whatever it was, so she started to veer kind of across uh, Boylston Street to the right side. And right as she started to do that, the second bomb went off right, like lateral with her, right near her. And a huge piece of shrapnel, like the size of an iPhone, lodged in her uh, left calf, I believe. And it's sort of the impact and, and 
and her trying to jump out of the way kind of pushed her on to the other sidewalk. And she's laying there against the barricades, and she's bleeding heavily. I mean, she really is, she's worried that she's going to die right there because no, she feels like nobody's helping her, people are running by, there's no, I don't want to say no hope for her, but she sort of feels like people have forgotten about her. And then, just then, almost sort of like in this, kind of like an angel, this woman who was a nurse, a, number, a former emergency room nurse, who was not on duty but was there with her husband and kids, watching, came to her and said, you know, I'm going to help you. I'm not going to leave you. And so she takes, I think, her husband's coat or belt, I can't remember, and helps tie a tourniquet around her leg. And then she helps her into the back of um, a police car, because that was the only vehicle that was available. All the ambulances were taken. And as it turned out, the police car, I think, was the police car of the, who's the guy in the Red Sox bullpen with the famous, like, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? The cop who has his hands up in that famous mm -hmm. photo? Mm -hmm. It's that guy, I think. I think it's his Steve cop car. Hogan. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's whose car it was. And anyway, and so Allison, this woman, Nancy, nurse, is, Nancy is helping Allison into the car. And Allison, rem remember, she hates marathons, right? She is, didn't want to do this, but she like was right there. And she can literally see the finish line, but she's not across it, right? She's here, and the finish line is there, and this woman is helping her into a car. And as Nancy is helping her into the car, Nancy, even as she's worried about losing her life, has a presence of mind to say, do you think you can carry me across the finish line? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Which is such a great moment, you know? And I think it really captures that marathoner spirit. Um, that even, I mean, maybe it just makes her crazy, and it shows you how insane marathoners are, but even in that moment, she wants to finish the race, you know? And... Um, but she didn't. She did not, right? Nancy <laughs> then has the presence of mind to say, you know what, honey, we're not going to do that right now. We're going to get you to the hospital, uh, which of course was the right call, which Allison saw later. But at the time, it felt like, you know, this goal was right there and it was sort of all important. Um, so let's talk about the trial for just a couple of minutes because it's going on and everyone's paying attention to it, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, is everyone following the trial? I'm curious. Is everyone following the trial closely or not that closely? I'm curious what everyone's. How to avoid it. Hard to avoid it, that's true. <laughs> exactly. It's true. So everyone knows probably where it's at. There's two phases to this trial. The first phase was the guilt phase, where it was a question of whether or not he had actually committed these crimes. And then the second phase is the death penalty phase, in which the same jury decides whether or not Jahar, the, the surviving brother, gets life in prison without parole or the death penalty. It's only a death penalty of case, of course, because it's a federal case. We don't have the death penalty in Massachusetts. Um, but because it's a federal crime, it is death penalty eligible, and therefore it is a death penalty case. The prosecution, you know, all the way up to Eric Holder at the time, made the decision to go uh, for death in this case. So it's made it a much more high-profile um, trial, I think, than it even would have been otherwise. Um, and now we're seeing, I think just today, right, or yesterday, today or yesterday was the first day where you've seen the defense really say much of anything at all, because they did not at all challenge the, um, really, the, the guilt, in the guilt phase at all. There's not really any question that he did it. And so their entire goal is to humanize him enough to, sh to, to try to get at least one juror to say, yeah, you know what, I do see some forces in his life that would have led him maybe to do this, and therefore, I don't want to, I don't think we should execute him. Um, I think it's a tall order in this case. I mean, any to even get on the, on the, in the jury pool as a juror, you have to be willing to apply the death penalty, right? In the questioning of jurors, if you say, I don't believe in the death penalty, or you know, I, I, I couldn't put someone to death, then you're automatically disqualified from the jury. So everybody here has at least acknowledged, or at least said, I'm willing to put someone to death if the, if the circumstances were right. But all it takes is one of them to say no. Um, and now we're starting to see what the defense his real game is here, which is to try to put up his family on the stand, of course, to say Tamalin was this horrible person who radicalized him, and Jahara was this young, impressionable kid. Um, and you know, his family was a disaster, his mom was really con controlling, and then left, and she had mental health problems. And you know, you're starting to see them try to build this narrative, right, that gives you, or at least an attempt, to, to give people a sense that he is the product of his experiences, and not all of them were his fault. Um, and um, his attorney, Judy Clark, is a famous death penalty attorney. She's done, 
a ton of the most high profile cases. She represented Jared Loftner, the, the guy who shot um, Gabby Giffords in Arizona. Um, she defended Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. Um, she worked on uh, Susan Smith, the woman in South Carolina 20 years ago who drove her, drowned her two children by driving him into the lake in South Carolina, that horrible case. Um, she has a famous line from that trial where she said, I'm not asking for your sympathy, I'm asking for your understanding. And, you know, that's a little bit of a kind of semantic, <laughs> it's quite a distinction to make. Um, but I think in her mind, they, they are different things. She's saying, look, we're not trying to make you necessarily feel bad for this person or feel empathy for them, but we're just trying to ask you to understand kind of where they came from, right? And in Susan's case, she had had all kinds of issues with depression, depression and abuse and so forth. So we're seeing that unfold now. I don't know how long, how long do we think? A couple more weeks? Maybe. Yeah, I've heard everything that. from weeks to months, which I think that's a little I don't think it'll be months. I feel like it's going to be weeks. I mean, the jury, who knows how long the jury will take to decide. And one of the, this is kind of legally, but one of the fascinating things I think about the differences in the trials, there's different standards for evidence, right? So in, this, in the penalty phase, you have a lot more leeway as to what you can actually introduce if you're the prosecutors or the defense. And so you've seen the prosecutors, uh, was it last week, who came out with, they showed the video in court of, of mm -hmm. Jahar flipping his middle finger at the camera, at the security camera when he was being held. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing that would never fly in, a, in the guilt phase, right? Because you can't, that happened after the crime and you can't use that to somehow, you know. Prejudice. Right, prejudice the jury about his motives or his mentality. But in this kind of, in the, in the penalty phase, it's perfectly allowable. And I actually think, I'd be curious to see what you think of this, but I think that's arguably more damaging to him, to his case, the sort of indifference and the kind of the, the, the lack of um, regret or the apparent lack of kind of regret or sorrow coupled with the kind of like middle finger, mm. I think is maybe even more damaging than the worst footage of the carnage of Boylston Street. Because I think it shows, or mm. it, sh it shows a lack of any kind of Mm -hmm. you know, care about what, what, what he's done. What do you think? Well, I would, argue, I would say that that gesture that he made at the camera doesn't necessarily reflect. I thought it was very interesting then when the, um, when the other side put, showed other f footage, when, when the defense showed him using the camera kind of as a mirror to mm -hmm. comb his hair and kind of making the case that, you know, he's just there kind of goofing around right. in a variety of different ways. And right. so it's, it's very interesting to see how they chew, you know, the, the presentation yes. is so. Yes, because you could argue it, it fits into the defense case too, right? Like the prosecutors can say, look, he's a jerk, he doesn't care. Defense can say, no, no, see, this just fits in with what we're saying. He's like a dumb, impressionable, like pothead college mm -hmm. kid, right? They would do some stupid gesture to the mm -hmm. camera because he's, and he was giving the peace sign as well. Right. So it's like, he's, is right. he just fooling around or is he really expressing his innermost Absolutely. resolve to have no, I don't know. Absolutely. I don't know. But I was, I was very struck by the poll that came out just a few days ago that showed that here, that locally, the opposition to the death penalty in his case has actually increased since the beginning of the trial, which for me is the opposite of what I would have predicted given the incredibly graphic, excruciating testimony that we've all had to live through, I would have expected it to creep upward at least a little bit. So I don't know what that, I don't know if you have a theory about that, but um, it also points out to me in a way that, that there's this disconnect between what's going on at the trial and the place where these events happened. Um, in terms of you know what the prosecution is trying to accomplish there and kind of the mindset and the will of the people who were most affected by it. Um, so it's, I don't know, that, that to me is a very interesting thing to think about. Should we have room for questions? Sure. All right, um, so what, what questions do you have? What, can we, what have we told you about the book or about the trial or? Just, no hard, just no, hard, no hard ones, okay? Just keep I was it. I thinking about the trial in the Bozeman paper yesterday that the defense is trying to portray that the prison they would send him to would be worse than being yeah. killed. Yeah. Right. And Unabomber is there, and they don't Absolutely. let them out for more than one hour for the whole day or whatever. But. Yeah, she wanted that had something to do with, with people changing their mind. If this is a horrible, horrible way to live, maybe it's a better punishment. Mm. 
like people have thought more about that. Yeah. And I wonder too if the testimony in the trial about um, kind of uh, Jahar's expressions that he, that he envied his brother for dying and becoming a martyr and that he wished that for himself. Mm -hmm. uh, that's right, that's right, that's right. Yeah, and I think I think people I think it's easy if you don't know that much about the system to assume that um, if he's put to death, you know that this will happen. Like if he's sentenced to death, let's say the jury comes back and says, okay, you know, yes, uh, this will somehow happen quickly, and he's gone. It's the end of the story. But it's actually the reverse. I mean, it really is that he would disappear so much faster if he's put into that prison. Um, because the federal government has, you know, is executed. What, it's like two or three people, you mm -hmm. know, like ever. Mm -hmm. And there, the appeals process and the challenges will go on forever, and he'll be back in the news. And this was a point that the Richard family uh, made, I think, very, very eloquently in, in, in coming out and saying we want life instead of the death sentence. Because they're absolutely right that if he gets a death sentence, it's going to be in the news and in the news and in the news for years. Every time it comes back up, and, and that their kids are going to have to deal with that. Whereas if he goes away to that supermax, the ADX supermax prison in Colorado, that's it. That's it. You know, right my I mean, taxes are going to pay to feed him. I'm sorry. Taxes. My taxes are going to pay to. Feed True. I mean, that's the that's the other side. That if he stays alive, you're paying for him in the prison system. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I got a, a not a question, a comment. Sure. The nature of an explosion is that forces go in all directions. I've seen nothing about all these pellets stayed very low below the knees, and there were all leg injuries. I don't understand how an explosion could do something like that. And my other comment is I would hesitate one minute to vote for the death penalty. Mm -hmm. you, you would not hesitate to vote? OK. Okay. What do you have a, I mean, there were some people that had injuries. You're saying that you don't understand the, how the, why, it didn't why it's up. so controlled? Right, yes. I think uh, it's. pressure cooker, it blows up in all directions. Right. Um, I, don't, I don't have enough technical knowledge about bomb making um, to answer that, except to say that, a court, you know, in spending time with Dr. King, in, he described these injuries as being very consistent with what you see with. IEDs in Iraq and Afghanistan, where the low position is what creates the, the dominating injuries in the lower extremities. So I think that's true that you, you had certainly Denise Richard had um, a severe eye injury. Um, and I'm, I think there are other examples of things that happened. Uh, it probably had something to do as well with how people were positioned at the time. But I think that's a whole field of expertise that unfortunately I lack. I mean this is a, a sort of a morbid point but I mean because it's so low on the ground and the bomb comes up I mean those are really packed areas mm -hmm. so I mean a lot of that debris is coming up it's just hitting people you know what I mean it's before hitting it up. before it comes mm -hmm. up right I mean one of the things that we were struck by and I think even Heather and some of the people we talked to in the book are, were struck by is the random nature of these things that there were people that were closer you mm -hmm. know to the to it's the true. actual bombs that it's were true. left hurt just because of the way that the stuff flew? I mean, I mean just indiscriminate enough. Heather had a friend standing shoulder to shoulder with her who was un completely unscathed, walked away fine. Um, and there were people in between Heather and the bomb itself, same thing. Um, Heather and others have expressed, um, I mean, this is a terrible thing to think about, but they carry a kind of I don't know if you call it guilt or gratitude or what the right word for it is, but they have this in understanding that the people who died that day, in a way, saved other lives because they bore the brunt of the impact in many cases. So um, it's just uh, the kind of tragedy where it's the randomness of it is so overwhelming, I think, to think about. Yeah. Going off of that, um, if he is to get life in prison, I'm um, not sure how the how it would actually work, whether it be solitary confinement or if he'd be in a general population, but you have to wonder how long he would last. Um, there's that honor code mm -hmm. among prisoners. They, I mean, Jeffrey Donald was killed while he was in prison, yep. unexpectedly, mm -hmm. um, especially since, I mean, all the deaths, but especially since uh, one of the deaths was a child. There's that yep. you have a child, and that's not 
all rated. Mm -hmm. So you have to wonder how long he would last if that's going to be mm -hmm. the end result. You know, would something happen to him if he's not? Right. right. Yeah, that's a good question. Right. I mean, you do see those things happen. I mean, from what I've read, it seems like um, it's likely that he'll be in solitary. Yeah. But you know, what, you know, how much? To your point, I mean, to how much? How much energy and, and resources do are put into keep preventing that from happening? You know, and is it? I don't know enough about the prison system to know. Is he never around anyone else? Is there a brief opportunity where someone? I don't know. Um, but I, yeah, I can't imagine he'd be looking forward to to that. Absolutely. Other questions? No. You did a good job in the book. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. A lot of research. That's very Thank nice you. to hear. Thank, Thank you. you. And we should mention that, I mean, the, I think that we have the paperback version up there. The paperback yes. version um, just came out a couple of weeks ago and actually has uh, a new chapter in it for what it's worth about um, last year's race, the 2014 race when Meb won. And it adds a nice little coda to the original book. Of course, the original book, one of the, our goal was to get it out uh, for the year anniversary. So the original, the hardback came out um, around the 2014 marathon, and then this one, paperback, came out around this marathon. Um, unfortunately, it was a little too, came a little too soon to get any of the trial stuff in there, um, but you get a little taste of kind of the forward progress. That could be another book, the trial. <laughs> Practically. Maybe, yeah. I don't know if someone else is willing to write it. I'm not sure I'm going to sign yeah. up for that one, but possibly. Awesome. I have one question. Did you find it, at, as colleagues here working together, did you find it to be emotionally draining, writing this kind of book? I mean, I read it when it first came out and recommend it to everyone. It's not an easy read. It, it's extremely well done. It's not an easy read. So if you're looking for a you know, happy thing to read at the beach, <laughs> However, can you not put that on Amazon? It's not, it's not, you know, it really, by, by taking just a few main characters, mm -hmm. it, if you didn't know it was nonfiction, you'd go, wow, what a great imagination these people have. Because that's how in depth all of these characters become. So you almost are seeing what happened that day through their eyes. And, and you captured it so well that I was saying, reading this, go like, how did how did this doctor do what he did? You know, run the marathon and grab a banana and go and, and work. And this young policewoman who, you know, was trying to escape all the terrible things in New York to now how does she, you know, get the emotional fortitude to be able to go forward and do it? And I have a friend that ran her first marathon the year of the bombing. Mm -hmm. A mile out, they stopped it. Mm -hmm. And She's texting, you know, we're texting back, where are you, I'm okay, you know. And, and then when, when they ran it, the following year they let them do the, the last mile after, right. this, after the fact, and she just finished her this year's. Um, but she said, it's still, it's very hard to cross that finish line, yeah. not think of these people. Not just the main characters that we know, the Heather Abbotts, but what about the hundreds of people that had minor injuries or that had emotional injuries mm -hmm. that, are going to jump now every time they hear a loud noise, mm -hmm. and they won't take their children to the marathon. We used to go to the marathon with the kids all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. You went to the game, you went to the marathon. Just that's what we did. Mm -hmm. So how how would that impact people that have the fear now of going? Mm -hmm. I don't, but you know, we went down the the weekend after. I'd be in Boston, my husband and I. What I enjoyed was the fact that the the streets were absolutely packed with people. Everyone was having dinner, everyone was at a restaurant, <clears throat> everyone was at the memorial paying their respects. And so I think they were saying like, screw you guys, we're gonna do this, this is who we are. Right. And you know, to the, to the Red Sox, Boston Strong, I mean, mm -hmm. there it is. Mm -hmm. But for but anybody recommend this is definite, and I've read a few of them, and I gotta tell you, your work should be applauded. Thank you, that's very nice. You so we should much. bring you to all yeah. of our events. Yeah, <laughs> that's quite a nice endorsement. Very nice. Thank you. No, it was. I mean, to your, to your question, I mean, it was. It was hard to write at times, but I think we were such under. We were under such an intense deadline pressure that we kind of didn't have room for that until well, after. That's your professional. Until lesson. afterward, right? I mean, we're we're trained to kind of do that a little bit. Right. Um, but we 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 each had our moments where it was. I think it was hard. I mean, it's 
it's hard not to be well, affected by it, in, you know, in some way. And we both and you made some friends along the way. Look at these great people that you met. That's yes, right. no, we did. Um, and we I'm did. sure that you know you'll perhaps stay in touch with them over the years, and hopefully, they all. Do. And everyone, it affected the world. I was in Germany a month after, mm -hmm. and I was on a train from Frankfurt to Paris. And my seatmate, you know, you get to talk to people. A gentleman, a German gentleman from my age bracket. How do you do? How do you do? And of course, where are you from? I always say Boston because it's. And the first thing out of his mouth was, "Is everybody okay? How do you know? Your city is wonderful." And it went on and on and on. Well, here we are. How many miles away? And this person um, that I couldn't get him to stop talking about it. He wanted to know as many details as I could possibly give him. So I thought, look at the worldwide scope of an event like this. Right. And that's, that's really true. Why you should ship this. Translated into other languages. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good plan. There, that's right. That's right. You know, sort of reminded me of 9/11 when everybody was. Oh yeah, right. In New exactly. York's gone. Here, right. you know, Boston. It, it was sort of coming all happening. I should say, just to um, sort of uh, come full circle, that the day before the marathon, Scott and I went to a, a party that Heather Abbott had on Boylston Street to kick off her new foundation that she just started, a nonprofit foundation called the Heather Abbott Foundation, that's going to raise money um, to try and help uh, other amputees get more advanced prosthetics so that they too can get back the lives that they had um, before. So she is continuing to just do amazing stuff um, that has really all come out of this experience. So yeah, I think that, I think you're right that we will I will be curious for a long time to come about her next step and where she's going to end up with all of this. Mm -hmm. We watched the uh, marathon last year and this year from the halfway point in Wellesley Square. Mm -hmm. And this year, the weather was terrible. Awful. Yeah. And the crowd was large, very large. Mm -hmm. And the enthusiasm was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a record number of runners, I think 30 odd thousand, which showed you that We've recovered in, in that way anyway. Mm -hmm. Very true. Yeah, last year there was, I mean, they had to really turn people away last year for the first one after the bombing. I mean, they, it was hard to get into that marathon because everyone wanted to come and run it. And I think that was a great, great thing to see. And l l at least, I'm happy that we had bad, bad weather this year and not last year. I think last year we needed like a 75 degree perfect marathon day. Mm -hmm. It wasn't so great for the runners. It was a little hot, but... You know, I'm looking out for myself, and it was a great day to watch. <laughs> Those that didn't finish were automatically qualified Correct. to enter again. That's right. That's right. That's right. What they did is there's usually three flights of 9,000, 27,000, and they added another 9,000. So it was, went up to 36,000. It was, um, yeah, it was one of the biggest races. There was a 100th anniversary running of the race in 96. That was also pretty big, but I think this was either just as big or almost as big or bigger, I can't remember. Um, thank you all so much for coming, and Josh, thanks so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, happily, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if anyone has a book, we're happy to. We're happy to sign it.